Hi, Stephen Hand from Staccata in Hobart. Over the last few weeks, quite a few people on various PEMA forums have been talking about the concept of frog DNA and have been asking what it is and is it something that's good to use or something that isn't good to use. And I wanted to discuss what it is uh, and how that term is used in several different ways. Now, obviously it refers back to the, uh, to the movie Jurassic Park and indeed the book Jurassic Park where there were gaps in the DNA of the dinosaurs they were recreating and those, these were filled in with frog DNA. Um, and this is the way that the term was originally used and I first heard it from Greg Mealy of the Chicago Swordplay Guild and somewhere back in the 90s and Greg was using it to refer to when an author is genuinely silent on a, on a topic where they really do say nothing at all and there is a gap that needs to be filled in and he was discussing how best to fill in that gap right what's the best way to fill in that gap if a gap genuinely exists now what he was saying is that just as in Jurassic Park it's better to fill it in with some DNA from a similar source than to to use that genetic uh, metaphor to, to fill it in with a random sequence um, because what's the alternative to going to a going to a, a similar author and finding a similar situation described and using what that author said the alternative is to make it up as you go along now that's part of all of our interpretation we look at what the masters say um, and we say oh, okay I think they mean that we should do it this way all right and then we go out and we test it all right um, so really for what frog DNA is saying is rather than something that I worked out on Saturday afternoon in my backyard um, with my training partner I'm going to use what this similar author using the same weapon writing at about the same time said okay so that's the, the first definition of frog DNA and I'm going to give you an example of that uh, when Paul Wagner and I were first working with manuscript 133 and we were lucky enough to have uh, access to uh, Jeffrey Forging's early translation um, when we started working with that we ran into the problem that, that the author of manuscript 133 says almost nothing about footwork he mentions the tread through a couple of times but we were working initially with the prima custodia first first guard underarm and the author says nothing about footwork uh, in the early sequences that he describes from that guard. Now what, what I'm going to show you uh, is the first thing that you're told to do when the uh, priest forms underarm and the scholar replies by forming half shield is that uh, you're told that the priest should fall under the sword and everyone agrees that that is referring to an underbind and but the problem is that as you can see here if you do it without any footwork then you risk getting hit hit in the head the, the angles and the um, and the leverage are just all wrong and you can be hit in the head now what I'm what I'm going to show you now is um, variants of footwork. If you do an, a straightforward advance from underarm as you fall under the sword, uh, there's another problem that arises. Um, you can only guard one target. If you expose your forearm as you advance, then um, you're going to get hit in the forearm. If you cover the forearm with the buckler, then you expose the head and the person in half shield can strike you on the head and in fact this is this is mentioned uh, in the manuscript but if you do a straightforward advance there's really nothing that you can do um, to avoid having that happen to you 
So what can you do to get around this problem? Well, in the early 2000s, when we were looking at Manuscript 133, on one of my <coughs> excuse me on one of my trips to the United States, I went to a class by Bob Charon at uh, at an event I was at, and he was talking about uh, Fiore's sword in one hand. And Fiore has one guard for the sword in one hand, and basically it's underarm. Now, let's not be pedantic. I know there are differences. It's not an identical guard, but it is a very similar guard. So Fiore is essentially using underarm. And Fiore says that when you're bringing your, your hand out from underarm, you need to make a clearing step to the left, a circular step to the left. By circular step, I mean if you did 100 of them, you'd come back to where you started. Uh, so we're not actually closing distance, but we are moving forward and left. So Fiore insists on you making this, this step forward and left. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, I wonder whether that will solve our problem. Went back to Australia, uh, started doing it with Paul, did the little Fiore step, and lo and behold, all of our problems were solved. If you step forward and left, it gives you a better, better angle on the bind, and it allows you to do the next part of the sequence. The author of 133 says, um, if he goes for your head, you can use a stab knock. So, what we can see here is that if the scholar tries to strike to the strike to the head uh, as the priest is underbinding, then the priest can simply turn their hand out of the underbind and strike to the face in a stab knock. So, is this what the author of 133 intended us to do? Uh, well, that's a very firm maybe. Uh, it fits the everything in the text, right? Nothing that you've seen here contradicts anything in the text. Um, it adds some material in where the author is silent. It adds some footwork that the author doesn't uh, tell us anything about that is necessary to make it work. Uh, but we always need to have that idea in the back of our heads that even if something matches the treatise perfectly, even if it works in bouting, it still only might be right. right? I've replaced plenty of stuff where, which has satisfied both those criteria and I've later gone on and said, no, no, actually, look, I want to tweak that. There's a better way to do it. So what, we're, what we've got is we've got two possibilities when the author is silent. We can either look to other authors to fill in the gaps, or we can fill in the gaps ourselves. We can either use frog DNA, or we can use, essentially, random sequence. Is the term frog DNA used uh, in other senses? Yes, it certainly is. Um, increasingly, uh, in the modern world of HEMA, it's being used uh, in a pejorative sense to refer to Borrowing from other manuals when the, the author you, that you're looking at isn't silent. So saying, for whatever reason, I can't be bothered um, working out this, what the author's saying is a little bit too complicated, um, or whatever, I'll just take what this other author is saying. I'll just assume that what my author is saying is what the other author is saying. Uh, and that is, of course, sloppy research um, and won't lead to a very good interpretation. Another sense in which I've seen it used is in terms of uh, used deliberately in t to create a hybrid system. And that's all well and good. It's not my cup of tea, but if that's what you want to do, uh, you know, whatever floats your boat, as long as you're honest about it. Um, all I'll say about a hybrid system is that you know, if, if we think about the classic hybrid system is Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. He was already um, a master of one system and he took elements from other systems that, that fitted in with that perfectly, that didn't uh, contradict or, or damage anything to do with, with the system he already knew. 
Um, whereas a lot of people I see these days are saying, oh, look, you know, oh, I have a couple of Fiore's, um, three Lichtenau's and a pack of chips, thanks. Um, and systems are systems. They work because they're based on core principles. And if you just start picking techniques because they look cool, um, they're not going to go together very, very well. And in some cases, they might actually work against each other. Um, in terms of principles. So it's not what I'd recommend, but if you're being honest, well, good luck to you. Um, a fourth way that I've seen the term frog DNA used, um, and in fact, arguably a fourth and a fifth because there's two subgroups in this, is where people introduce uh, modern ideas into their interpretation of HEMA. And this can be done deliberately. I, I know people who um, use modern sports science and ideas of biomechanics uh, to work with HEMA. Again, not my cup of tea, but as long as you're being honest about it. Um, the other thing which is a lot more common, a lot more, a lot more pernicious, is where people take their understanding of modern martial arts, particularly modern fencing, uh, and as we'll discuss in a bit, other modern ideas and colour their interpretations with those. When I first started out with, with HEMA, before it was called HEMA, um, I made myself very unpopular with um, a few modern trained fencing masters who insisted that there was only one way of fencing and that um, essentially they looked at rapier fencing as dumbed down modern fencing um, and I think we can all agree that that's not a valid interpretation um, and so everything was looked at through this lens of modern fencing now I've done modern fencing um, it's really useful um, there are certainly a lot of things in rapier fencing small sword that are, are very similar to what's still done in modern fencing or at least was done when I did it um, some of what I see in modern fencing oh, don't get me started um, but a lot of what's done in modern fencing does is a direct linear or um, a lineal descendant of what was done in rapier fencing. So that's fine as long as we don't go in there with the classic Buddhist full cup, as long as we go in there with the empty cup and say, well, what is the treatise actually telling us? All right? We don't go in with the assumption that it's going to be just like what we already know. Uh, and I'll say that about all martial arts. If I get students who come in the door who say, I already know martial arts and aren't willing to open up and accept what you want to teach them, they don't actually learn very quickly. Uh, whereas people with prior martial arts experience who come in with the empty cup and say, all right, I'm probably going to know some of what you're going to teach me, but just tell me what, you know, what is it that you're teaching? Um, they will find, oh, okay, all right, I can already do this. Oh, that's new, all right, okay. And they tend to progress very, very rapidly. Um, now, one thing where I've seen the introduction of modern ideas is quite recently in a discussion of Silver's Times, um, where somebody was, was seemed to be quite unaware that the way they were using... Um, the idea of speed in, in times was essentially in a Newtonian way. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, of course, Newton didn't write till 80 years after Silver. So if you're trying to introduce Newtonian physics as opposed to Aristotelian physics, um, that's introducing an anachronism. Um, and the thing is, Newtonian physics is just so embedded in our our understanding of the world, that it's a really easy thing to do, but we've got to be really careful not to bring in our modern ideas and our modern prejudices um, to an interpretation of a historical martial art. So in conclusion, what do we have? Will the real frog DNA please stand up? The original use of the term by Greg Mealy to fill in gaps um, and using the nearest analogue to, to do that uh, is a legitimate thing to do. I think we can all agree that that's a legitimate way to use material from other sources because whatever we're going to do, we're going to have to fill that gap in with something and 
to use the DNA analog, we can either use our frog DNA or we can use random sequence. All right. Uh, in most cases, frog DNA will be a better a better option. See what the masters at the time said. The, but we also get three other definitions, arguably four other definitions, um, filling in places, taking DNA from somewhere else and putting it in where there was already DNA um, existing. That's wrong. Uh, creating a hybrid system if you want to, but yeah, not my cup of tea, uh, and bringing in modern ideas, um, which in general is a, a bad idea and um, will give you a false interpretation, which leaves us with, well, you know, what is frog DNA? Um, is it a useful term? And it could be argued that given that it has started to be used in a pejorative sense, which was not the way it was originally coined by Greg, um, that it may well have outlived its usefulness. Um, that that useful term for this is how we fill in the gaps, um, it isn't really a useful term anymore, which is a great shame. Um, but it's up to us, what does the term mean? I've given you the, the ways in which I've seen it used. Um, do we settle on one of those on the original meaning? Do we settle on it being a pejorative term? Um, how do we use it? And in fact, do we still use it? Thanks for watching.